everybody and welcome to the Squiggly Quiz podcast. I'm Helen. And I'm Sarah. And this is a weekly podcast to help you navigate through all the ups and downs and ins and outs of your careers, where we hope that we can provide a community of people all working on their squiggly careers together and give you some ideas of actions to support you as you progress your way through it all. And today we're talking about, I think, quite an uncomfortable topic. One that (laughs) when we've mentioned to a few people, we're going to talk about it. You can see people wince and get a bit tense but you know, never want to shy away from a difficult challenge. We're talking about ego, ego at work, your ego, (laughs) other people's ego, what it means. Sarah's ego. Yeah, to be honest, when we've (laughs) tried to design today, we tried to make it very practical. So the only way to do that is with lots of examples. So this is going to be fun. Uh, (laughs) Let's see how I feel by the end of this. Probably not great about myself. And when we think about (laughs) ego and its relationship with squiggly careers... It's interesting because Helen and I had quite different initial reactions to the relationship between ego and squiggly careers. I actually felt really positive. I thought, oh, maybe quite a lot of ego is tied up in command and control environments, being more hierarchical. There is a relationship, I think, between ego and power. So perhaps as our organisations get flatter, ego might be a bit less of a challenge, maybe everybody can sort of feel more confident in themselves and and it's less about the kind of position that we are on an organizational chart so I was feeling really upbeat about that and then Helen had a different perspective it was quite a bit more challenging weren't you I feel like that sounds like I was really negative which is not normally my normal stance but I was thinking well if you get rid of the hierarchy I don't think that automatically means that you get rid of ego because you have to have a deep-rooted sense of self so that you are confident in the work that you do and the worth of your work independent of other people I think you have to both get rid of the ladder which has all these like slightly ego appealing things (laughs) attached to it and at the same time develop your own sense of self-belief and if you do that together then I think squiggly careers are amazing but if you just get rid of the ladder and you don't help people to develop their self-belief then I think maybe people feel a bit lost and then start to fall into more career comparison and then as we'll talk about that could be one of the traps for ego to start to thrive. So essentially our summary was there's pros and cons. <laughs> <laughs> probably like probably like most things. More great insights coming up in this yeah. episode. <laughs> and when we think about what is ego, and as we said, it probably will feel quite uncomfortable to think about. We also had a discussion about, you know, is ego inherently bad? And I think, though we aren't real kind of psychological experts in this area, ego seems to just really mean our sense of self. It, ju- it just actually means like I your sense of who you are and I think the challenge is when your ego becomes inflated it's at that point where your sense of self you maybe feel superior or better or as Helen said you're kind of comparing yourselves to others because you want to make yourself feel like you're better than they are then that's where it creates a challenge and that's where you can get in your own way and actually when we have talked before about fixed mindset it's interesting that I think fixed mindsets often come from one of two places, fear and ego. And I think we recognise and almost feel happier thinking about fear because, you know, we talk a lot, don't we, about like fear of failure or fear of not being good enough. And somehow that feels maybe more familiar. But when we talk to people about fixed mindset around ego, I think that's just a topic that it's almost got inherently all of these quite negative connotations and we don't like to think of ourselves as kind of having an ego even the word has quite bad associations I think. So what we wanted to start with is a bit of an honest assessment of your ego and (laughs) we have six different statements which we are going to say out loud and I guess the question for you to answer for yourself is which one of these or which ones of these six statements feel familiar to you and what we'll do as well is we'll put these six statements on the pod sheet so don't worry about having to listen and reflect and write all this down all in one go we'll put it on the pod sheet that you can get from amazingif.com but also to make it a bit more real I am going to ask these six statements to Sarah and she's going to answer whether yes or no these feel familiar to her so you can get a bit of an insight into her and the questions as we go do you just want me to do yes no or or do I elaborate or do we just go really straight binary yes no (laughs) I mean (laughs) you see how you feel when I say the questions okay okay (laughs) and the idea with this so people know 
what we're aiming for, kind of what good looks like, is we thought it'd be really helpful to be able to answer the question, my ego is most likely to get in my way when dot, dot, dot. So we were trying to figure out how do you develop your self-awareness knowing that we all probably have moments where our ego does inflate and isn't helpful. So just as we're going through these questions, that's ultimately what we're kind of aiming for. Right, that's just me putting us off, Helen. Right, let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> you can ask them back to me as well I'm ready afterwards. To this isn't just ego. about you. <laughs> I feel really bad putting you on the spot. No, okay, fine. are you ready? Yep. So which of these feels familiar? Yes or no? You get defensive when someone disagrees with you. Yes. People around you feed your ego rather than give you feedback. No. You rarely change your mind. No. You need other people to give you praise. Yes. You view your career in comparison to others. Sometimes. You're more likely to think that you're right than that you're wrong. Sometimes. (laughs) I love how you (laughs) snuck a sometimes option into it. I love it. Okay, so if you were to use your insights to answer the question then, my ego is most likely to get in my way when, based on the things that you answered yes and sometimes to, what would you say? I think what's interesting is as you're going through these questions is which are the ones that feel very familiar and I think it is almost we were quite binary there but in your head I think you start to develop a bit of a sliding scale and I think the one that sticks out for me is praise I definitely have a need for validation and praise I just know that about myself because I think that obviously feeds your ego so that one was the one that stuck out the most and I think the other ones that were sometimes is I can probably spot certain points in my career where it was more true So if I think about getting defensive when someone disagrees with me, that was more true at the start of my career than it is now. And I think that's because I'm more confident now. So, you know, we talked about that relationship between confidence and almost being able to keep your ego in check. I think when you're more confident in yourself, you're more open to people having different points of view, disagreeing with you. And you perhaps feel less like you have to protect your point of view. You know, I think that maybe it was your kind of starting in your career or you're learning to influence and persuade and those kind of things, you feel like if someone disagrees, you're doing something wrong. Or I think that's how I felt. But that one has changed for me over time. So that's why I was like, oh, sometimes I think I've learned to manage that and be much more open. So I kind of feel good about my progress in terms of managing my ego in that area. And then the career comparison one, I know is wrong, is I know is unhelpful. You know, when you think, I know this is not useful, but I do think that's one of those like traps you can fall into very occasionally. And I actually now, particularly on social media, really manage like who I follow, the time I spend on social media, because that's my kind of downfall when it comes to comparison. It's not actually my peers or people that I've worked with, the people I know who Actually, I'm just really happy for. It's almost the people I don't know. And I'm like, I don't even know these people. And then the you're right, then you're wrong. I think I can be guilty of that sometimes of thinking I can be quite decisive and I'm competitive. And I definitely have got an assertive personality. And I think the wrong side of that, I think if you catch me on a bad day, on a day where you're not at your best, and perhaps you're stressed, perhaps you're tired, Perhaps your kids come home from nursery with a COVID test, you know, just to give you an example. (laughs) Inside Sarah's life. Yeah, inside into my life at the moment. I think if you got me on the wrong day, I could let my ego inflate to be like, well, we don't need to talk about this because I know the right answer. I, I know how this should be done. And that is your ego talking and hindering you rather than helping, I think. But it feels like they feel hard questions to answer. They're not very nice things to acknowledge about yourselves because clearly this is not you at your best. Okay, now let's talk about you for a minute. <laughs> Sarah, I'm really sweaty. <laughs> I can see Sarah on camera. And she definitely didn't oh, like God. talking about that. So whilst you were talking there, it did make me think, both about myself and some other stuff around ego, it made me think about what are some ego activators. So for example, if you feel that you are more susceptible to viewing your career in comparison to other people, you might say, and that is activated mm. by social media. It's useful to think, when does that get triggered? And the other thing I was thinking, based on, which question for me felt most familiar which is that um, I'm more likely to think I'm right than I'm wrong I think that's definitely one that I get into 
But I was thinking, mm, isn't it interesting when you work with somebody who has the same <laughs> ego activator as you? Because then I think yeah. you get into an ego clash because let's say mine isn't, for example, the career comparison when I don't have that one. And so our egos don't necessarily clash if you have the career comparison and I have the more likely to think I'm right than I'm wrong. I'm not saying that they're good, but they don't clash. But when we both come at ego with the same one, which is we're both more likely to think that we're right than we're wrong, that's maybe where ego can feel really uncomfortable at work, where you both rarely change your mind or you both end up getting defensive when you're disagreeing with each other. It really starts to create an uncomfortable climate for ego at work. Yeah, it's interesting because I do, I recognise that in both of us. I think we probably both recognise it in each other. And what happens, I think, like us together at our worst, you go from two individuals that have the potential to go from very good to great when we're together and at our best to when both of our egos are clashing and then you both individually and together get even worse if that makes sense it dilutes (laughs) any of the brilliance and the strengths and all the good stuff that I think we both bring to the company that we run you kind of see that dissipating and, and really getting diluted and you're not even individually brilliant because that goes as well and so I think it's sort of, it's almost like the worst case scenario. So I think if you have the honesty and the awareness to spot this in yourself, but also to feel okay and to acknowledge that everybody has some of these things. I can't believe anyone is, I don't know if there's even a phrase for, I suppose if you've got lots of humility, that means that you don't have a really big ego, but we almost have moments, right? I really hope, I think I'm saying that in hope. We almost have moments where our ego gets in our way. I think, yeah. And also awareness of ego in a team like talking about this in a team I think whether you can all be you know have humility all the time I don't know but maybe just more awareness of what your ego is when it shows up and how it holds you back those are probably brilliant conversations to have in teams which hopefully hopefully you can start doing those six questions and then you can take some of the actions that we're now going to talk through (laughs) so that you can not get to that destructive situation that Sarah talked about where you're all you're all a bit worse off because of it. So we've got three actions for you and your ego, which I'll talk through. And then we've got three actions for how you can work more effectively when other people's ego might be getting in your way. So hopefully this will give you some things that you can take away and do after you've listened today. Shall I go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about ego less, by the way. (laughs) Oh, thanks. Oh, oh, is that me being ego full? Is that a word? (laughs) Oh, gosh, now we're just going to really psychoanalyze the situation. Okay, I'm just going to go first, everyone. Go for it. Uh, So, the first thing if you recognize those six statements in yourself and also where they might get in your way, one of the things that you can do is to more consciously listen than talk so think about if I was in a meeting with Sarah for example and I was recognizing that maybe the last meeting that I'd had my need to be right had resulted in the meeting going wrong then what I might think is do you know what in this next meeting I'm going to put myself in listener mode that hasn't helped us move forward so I'm going to consciously do much more listening than I am talking and there's a really nice quote from George Clooney who I'm not sure we've ever quoted in this quickly quiz podcast no, but before. I'm very on board with it I mean me too who said in his wise ways that you never really learn much from hearing yourself speak mm. I think it's true it's probably true isn't it it does make you stop and think a bit that if you want to have more humility. Actually, I saw one of our previous guests, Alex Cole from on the podcast, talking on LinkedIn last week where she talked about this idea of inverting the hierarchy. And as a leader, you should just be you should always be learning to listen. And that's what you should be spending most of your time doing. So I think whatever level you're at, but certainly if you're in any position of leadership or influence, just thinking about if your priority for this week was listening, like what would you do differently? I think you would really change your approach to conversations, to meetings, to projects. I'm going to talk now, but it's not because I'm not listening. <laughs> just, just to put that out there. Yeah, you've got yourself really stuck in a corner there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, dear. Um, so the second one, which I think I do really well with Sarah, is to cultivate your critics. <laughs> um, this is basically, the, you know, the point that we mentioned earlier, one of the questions about, you know, are you spending time with people who feed your ego rather than give you feedback? It's about consciously spending time with people who have a different perspective, who might challenge you, you know, they might sometimes give you some of the the harder news, some of that challenge that you might not always give yourself. I think thinking about people who 
maybe sometimes make you feel uncomfortable, either because they say things that you wouldn't or see the world in a way that you don't, is a really good way to make sure that you don't get in a bit of an ego echo chamber. I have looked back on my career and thought about some of the people that I found hard to work with at the time because of the day-to-day work, but actually become really beneficial people to spend time with in a slightly different context because they naturally see things differently. That's one of the way that I have cultivated some of the critics that will will say some of the things that I don't always say to myself. Yeah, I was reading one of the articles in preparation for today and someone had put a really lovely phrase where they said like honesty equals humility. And it's like if you've got that honesty with each other, if you can find people who will be really honest with you, it helps you to have humility because, you know, it helps you to see things clearly. But I think it also gives you confidence because it is a fine line, isn't it? I, I suspect loads of our listeners you know, at times we'll have also had challenges around making sure that you're confident enough. You know, we've talked a lot about caging those confidence gremlins. And so sometimes I feel like it's a real tightrope walk, isn't it? This having a strong enough sense of self and self-belief and self-esteem to have the confidence to navigate your squiggly career whilst keeping your ego in check at the same time. You know, I think we are asking quite a lot of ourselves. Yes, very true. And actually just thinking about it, because I was thinking, I think you're one of those people for me. And maybe it's not just cultivate your critics, it's cultivate your critical friends. Mm. Because this isn't people who want to just say bad things to you. This is people who want to help you to be at your best. And so I never, whenever Sarah gives me feedback, and you deliver feedback in a very clean and clear way, Sarah, which I think sometimes can almost feel brutal. But I don't think you don't... (laughs) (laughs) But you don't don't mean to be brutal. You mean to make me better. And that's why I don't go home and cry. (laughs) But no, because I know that you're saying it because you care and you have that ability to see how things can be. And it's like we've talked before about Bruce Staisley, who's one of our mentors, and when he gave us feedback on our TED Talk, which again was (laughs) delivered cleanly and clearly, which can sometimes feel brutal, but in support of us getting better, and it's those people that you want around you. Yeah, I think that they're so important. And and they're the people, those critical feedback friends, make sure you say thank you to them because they are worth their weight in gold because there's just not many of them. I think there's not many people who are prepared to be, I'm, I'm going to say honest, to help you be, to have that humility rather than brutal, which is a word you used about three times there, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, I'll, I'll say thank you. I'm supposed to, to describe you now, both right? me and Bruce. So uh, yeah, I'll put us in that same corner. Bruising. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the third and um, final action to help you manage your ego is to experiment with your ego assumptions. So often there are a lot of assumptions we make about our work, the way that we do it, when we have to do it. So for example, I might think about like social media. I need to be the person who does all the social media stuff for Amazing If Our Business because I know how it needs to be done and when it needs to be done and and what gets the best responses. Or I need to be the person that does all this stuff on the website because that's the thing that I'm best at. And sometimes when you put yourself into a little box like that and you sort of wrapped it up with a lovely ego based ribbon you don't really test those assumptions like unless I take on a different role and say well maybe I won't do that maybe someone else could do that or they might do it differently I don't see how it could be done better I don't give myself the space to do other things we just create all these assumptions over our work and our worth that we don't really challenge and that can well it starts to hold us back but it also starts to hold other people back because you don't give them the opportunities to develop in different ways as well Sarah what are some of the ego assumptions you think you might have had in your career? I think there have been times where I've been really flying in a role where I found it really hard to let go just because I think partly because I was enjoying it and I felt like I was doing a really good job so even small stuff like you know that idea of like I can't go on holiday because nobody I'm so important (laughs) yeah well nobody could possibly pick up this work and do it in the way that I can and that has even led to me probably working on holiday before where I haven't needed to because you just are not letting go of things I specifically remember a couple of examples of that earlier in my career I have a lesser problem with that now (laughs) it's a good thing about having a good co-founder I'd just be like oh Helen can do it it'll be fine (laughs) (laughs) thanks thanks for that maybe just on that I think the question to reflect on there is probably they what could you learn to let go of Mm. is probably the thing to think on afterwards and in particular I would say there's been some things that where I've let go, perhaps because it's even been slightly forced or I've had no choice, I have been consistently surprised slash delighted because 
people might not do things in exactly the same way that you do but different doesn't necessarily mean worse different can often mean better and I think every time I've let go of something very rarely have I ever thought oh that's been a disaster or that was the wrong thing to do all I've usually ever thought is I've learned something someone's surprised me someone's got even more potential than I'd perhaps given them credit for so I've never really had a bad experience of actually letting go of some things that I think were probably all to do with my ego So now let's talk about some ideas for action. If you are working perhaps with or for someone where you think maybe their ego is a bit inflated and it is hindering rather than helping you. And I think this is really hard because, you know, Helen and I were chatting beforehand and we were saying, obviously, it'd be great to be able to give these people feedback. Maybe that's slightly brutal feedback that Helen referred (laughs) to. But we were also thinking that feels really hard. That's quite a hard ask to do. So, of course, if you can have an open, constructive, challenging conversation about the impact that somebody's ego is having on you or on a team, we would always advocate for that. And we would always say that's a great thing to do if you can. However, we've got three different ideas for action that perhaps feel like an easier place to start or perhaps feel like if you're kind of not sure where to start, this doesn't feel like you're having to kind of go on a real limb to do something about it. So the first thing is an idea we're calling crowdsourcing perspectives. So this is the idea of if somebody's got a really big ego who you're working with, they often do think, as Helen described, it's sort of my way or the highway. I know the answer. And if you're trying to challenge that one-on-one, that can feel quite black and white. You know, like you've got one idea. Oh, well, I disagree. I've got another idea. And it can almost feel a bit like tennis or ping pong. You're just sort of going back and forth and you're not really making any progress. Whereas if you can create moments either in team meetings or project meetings or just any kind of catch-ups that you have with a few people where there is part of that meeting or even that meeting might be designed with the purpose of sharing different perspectives that can be really useful to encourage everyone involved to appreciate that there's more than one way to see the world that's what we're trying to get to here it's almost a little bit by stealth I would say it's sort of helping to sort of deflate someone's ego in a slightly stealthier way, which actually quite appeals to me because I can imagine doing this. And I think you might say in a team meeting, well, let's just spend a couple of minutes and perhaps could everybody share one other way that we could approach this? Or one thing that perhaps you've done before that might be really helpful for us all to learn from. You're just creating those moments where you're getting perspectives and it's less about there's a right way or a wrong way here. So let's say Helen was saying let's say we were updating something on our website and Helen was like, I think we should do it this way. And I was thinking, I think there are some other ways. I'm finding it quite hard to get Helen to maybe listen to me. What we could do as a group, we could say, well, let's all share one website we really like and what's really good about it. And it's just a different way of encouraging different type of conversation, I think, that helps people to kind of let go of their ego and it encourages that listening that we were talking about. So I like that as an idea because I think because I can imagine doing it. I was just thinking of like team exercises that could sort of encourage that culturally could be like the challenge and build approach. Yeah. So let's take an idea and we'll all everyone gives one challenge and everyone gives kind of one build or like the how might we questions that we've talked about or the um, pre-mortems. You know, when you take Mm. a project and you imagine if it failed and it just gives people that safe space to say, oh, well, imagine this was going to go wrong. What would we do differently? Just those sort of exercises that just give people the space to to challenge in quite a safe way. Yeah, I actually remember doing that very successfully once with a big project I was doing for Sainsbury's where it was about food waste. It was something I designed. So I was holding on quite tight to it, but I recognised, I was like, I need everybody's involvement with this. And honestly, we just did an exercise where it was like, how can we kill it? let's kill this project and I think the other thing that was really good from my perspective was it demonstrated to everybody I really wanted everybody involved and also being open enough to well if there is a real hole in this we either need to fill that hole or perhaps that hole is there for a good reason and we need to think differently I wasn't the most senior person in that room by a long way but I could kind of create that opportunity there probably were some relatively big egos in that room who got lots of expertise who knew a lot and there was probably some people who were starting out in their careers but it just created that chance for everyone to share which I think was really useful 
So the second idea for action is about moving from a I win to we win mentality. So this is really about collective success rather than individual success. And I think now in the work that we do, I was trying to think of any example of anything I've done this year where you'd be like, oh, well, this is purely about me. Because I think we all, you know, we work in a, in a small business. And even with everything that we do, I think you're always involving other people, whether that's inside your organisation or outside of your organisation, clients you're working with, partners you're working with. We're recording this actually the day after England lost the European Cup final in the football. Gareth Southgate, who's their manager, and quite a few of the players I saw have said this phrase as well today, which really inspired me. They all said, we win together and we lose together. And I think that both shows real humility, but also a bit of letting go of egos, which I'm imagining in football, you must have to have some quite big egos because of the, some of these players are incredibly talented. But it's this idea of it's not about one individual. So it's not about blaming one individual, but it's also about not about having kind of one superstar either. Everybody's got a role to play and actually recognising that everyone has a role to play. And Helen, what's that really nice phrase and kind of sentiment that you often share about rushing and kind of pointing to celebrate other people's successes when something goes right for you? It is actually another football-related point. Yeah. Who, who knew who that knew? I had a football-related point? It's Abby Wambach, who I think, I'm going to really embarrass myself yeah, now, I football. think American soccer captain, I think she used to be. Yeah. But she says that when you're successful, what you should do is point to other people who have helped you to be successful and when other people are successful you should rush to celebrate their successes so this idea of kind of really rushing and pointing out other people's success yeah I really love that and so you can do that as a team I think you know if you feel like perhaps you've got and this does happen and you know we know this happens in people's careers you know sometimes where there's one person taking all the credit and that always makes me really sad when that does happen and I'll, Perhaps that comes from, you know, people's egos getting in their way or perhaps they, they've had it happen to them. Who knows? It's always really uh, disappointing, I think, when you do experience that. But the thing that you can take responsibility for is when you're successful is also thinking about, well, who else can you include? Who else can you involve? Whose success can you celebrate at the same time as recognising the contribution that you've made too? And then the last idea for action is really a mindset point which is about not internalising someone else's ego. So it can feel really hard when you are working very closely, I think, with someone whose ego perhaps has got inflated, perhaps even unmanageable, the very end of kind of spectrum. That can really, I think, start to impact your days. It can feel like it seeps into you. And I think you have to remind yourself, A, what's important to you, and also give yourself some space. So... If you are in this situation now where you are finding perhaps that ego assessment that we just did, perhaps you can notice that someone you work with would be like a yes to all of those, but they wouldn't even have the awareness to know that they would be a yes. I'm like, that's to me would be the absolute worst case scenario. I think then you have to figure out, A, can you put as many boundaries as possible around that person and your relationship with that person? If you can, and I know this is much, much easier said than done, but not let their behaviours impact on you too much in terms of what you want to stand for and how you want to work. And then I think very practically, when I've experienced this at some points in my career, I've always found this helpful as a kind of tactic, try and then gravitate away from those people with these kind of really big egos and go towards those people you really admire who've got humility and kindness and who are interested in other people's perspectives and want other people to win and who maybe you know when we went through those questions they're open to disagreement they give you really positive and useful feedback they prepare to change their mind they praise other people because they want them to succeed you know they don't worry about comparing themselves and they very create this humble environment where everyone can be at their best you know none of us are perfect none of us do this all the time but I've definitely worked with leaders where that's a good description of how great they are. And so I think spend as much time as possible as you can surrounding yourself with those kinds of people. Of course, recognising as we've you know hopefully demonstrated today, everyone has those little moments of ego. But once you have the awareness, I think you can spot for yourself the actions that you can take, but also spend time with those people who've got that humility, who demonstrate all those really good behaviours because 
you'll learn loads. And I think then you also set yourself higher standards as a result of spending time with people like that. So I know today has probably been a bit of a harder topic. We definitely (laughs) debated it a little bit. We're like, should we talk about this? Should we not talk about this? And we decided to. But I actually, I hope you listening have found it useful. I feel really happy having talked about this, like kind of recognising that the stuff that works for and against us and things that I could do differently. I'm taking away some different things to do for myself. As I said, kind of midway through about the pod sheet. So lots of the questions that we have shared for you to reflect on, the ideas for actions, they'll all be summarised on the pod sheet. So just go to amazingif.com under podcast and you'll find that. And we'll put it in the link to the show notes as well. And in Pod Plus this week, rather than diving even deeper into ego, because we hopefully have given you enough in this conversation, we're actually going to be doing something slightly different. We have a guest. So we've got Zara Easton from LinkedIn, who's going to be running a Rock Your Profile session for us. It is free for you. It's 60 minutes to help you build your brand on LinkedIn. Zara will be covering everything from how you write your kind of statements about yourself, how you get recommendations, all the ins, outs and top tips of how to build your profile on LinkedIn. So if that is useful, please join us for Pod Plus and we will put a link as well to that in the show notes and that's everything for this week thanks as always for listening we really do appreciate it and we'll speak to you again soon bye for now bye everyone bye.